Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. Welcome to the Micro Review ADD Gaming Show. We're now in the world of sometime in January 1982 these games were released. We last left off with Time Zone for the Apple II, one of the largest games we've ever seen on the show. Let's see what our next game is. We're next going to the arcade in Japan, and this is Alpine Ski. Let's take a look at Alpine Ski, starting with the advertising flyer. Alpine Ski, making a great outdoor sport a great indoor sport, like all video games do. So this is by Taito. And there's an example of the advertising flyer with other regions. We don't have the Japanese one, so if you flip it over on the back, it's all in English. Now players can grasp the challenge of the slope, the thrill of intense competition year-round with alpine ski. And they give examples of downhill skiing, slalom race, and ski jumps. So this has three games to it. It says there's a chairlift that picks you up to the slope for the first competition, and then you accelerate. So there's one button to move faster than the slopes. And then after the challenge of the downhill, you have to ski between flags of the slalom, and then you have a ski jump if you get there in enough time. And there's the example of the arcade cabinet for Alpine Ski. Not the first ski game we've seen on the channel. It definitely won't be the last. There's our arcade PCB. And there we go for, for controls. Looks like, is it just a two-way joystick? It is. So we just go left and right. And then we have the Ski Faster button, which is the big white button. There's our arcade marquee for Alpine Ski. Taito's another excellent publisher. So we're hopefully going to see something pretty cool here. Let's take a look at the manual for Alpine Ski in the arcades. Does it have anything about the game itself? Most of these operator manuals for the arcade is about assembly, setup, and security. Let's see. Alpine Ski, the real enjoyment of skiing, is presented by lifelike downhill skiing, slalom racing, and ski jump competition. Object of the game is to maneuver your skier around snowmobiles, beginner skiers, skillfully enough to gain the highest amount of points and go on the slalom course and the jump competition. The speed is controlled by depressing the button, the only one you, ha the only one you have. Skiing down the slope successfully allows the player to chance to challenge the slalom course. Be careful not to knock down any poles or you receive a penalty. In the jump competition, use the radar found in the upper portion of the screen to maximize the distance of the jump. If we get that far, because you have to go pretty fast. And then the rest is technical, so that's all we get for how to play the game. We won't be setting up arcade cabinets here on Chronologically Gaming. Looks like for different versions, we got two different sets. We're going to the J Japan. And this is Alpine Ski, released sometime in January 1982. By Taito. And we're here. With some artwork around the CRT, love it when we get that. As if we are in Japan playing Alpine Ski for the very first time. Now, skiing video games, I'd say the competition's pretty pretty tight because one of the coolest ones we've seen was on the TRS-80 Coco, and that computer had a first-person skiing game. It made you feel like you were there. So the other ones we've seen like on consoles and television and Atari, they were good and played good, but... After playing a first-person skiing game, you can see here we got a top-down view, but they're doing a different perspective. Every other ski game that does this, we're going from the top and then moving our way down the slopes. All right, let's put a coin in and push start. Oh, there we go. Nice presentation. Having us going up the mountain first. And we're in. So I have just the two-way joystick, so all I can do is move left and right, but we need to go fast down the mountain, so I have one button to push. And there it is. Oh, man. Yeah, you, you move really quick. But then, of course, you risk <laughs> doing that. We had to see at least one crash. Part of the fun of playing all these games is seeing yourself die and seeing yourself crash. <laughs> you do, like, two double front flips before you, you totally waste out that. Uh, let's see. You go to the right here. Oh, a thousand points. Nice. How far left and right can you go? Let's see. So there's a 500 pointer. We have other skiers that are here too. One thing that's charming about this is they're adding music to it. Oh, I missed the 1500 points. All right, let's see if we just go, 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 go. <laughs> Since it is only a two-way joystick, you don't have really full control, or I should say very refined control. But still enjoyable, very fun to play. You can see the graphics are very similar to the other game by Taito, Crazy Climber. Their PCB is pushing color, which is very nice, and scrolling capabilities. Right, go, go, go. You gotta be near the end now. 
Yes. Okay, so we got the first part. How much time we have? Let's see if we can go and see all three rounds. On first try, probably not. So there's three different ways you can play, or three different kinds of games. So now we're in the slalom area. Got to go in between the posts. And of course, got to go fast. I think we missed one. One of the most impressive things is how it's scrolling left and right and up and down at the same time. <laughs> Out of my way! Oh, we, really, we, we lose time for that, it looks like. Slow down! <laughs> this is one of the things that's great about video games. If you've ever skied yourself, it is very dangerous to go this fast, but in video games, why not just go as fast as possible? Oh, and you flip out whenever you hit someone else. <laughs> nice. So it looks like six seconds left. I'm just going to go... I don't even know if it'll let me... Game over. Now, does it continue like we've seen with some of the other games in 1982? All right, put another quarter in. Or if we're in Japan, put another yen in. And let's go. This was distributed in other regions. We try to play the very first version or the very first one you could play. All right, let's just go. Forget the points. Time is a ticking. But, I mean, look at that scroll speed. It's very impressive. So, yeah, this is arcade, and if I was going to compare this to Intellivision and Atari, it wouldn't be fair, because Activision did a very good version. And the, the, this one would be the better one, obviously, because it's arcade. But taking this viewpoint and having you go up vertically on the, the course is a different take port. Almost. Okay, can we still get the 1,500 points? <laughs> I just saw the chat. Yes, you can reference as many celebrities that got an accident skiing. Here on Chronologically, we want Chron Chronologically Gaming wants to show you the horrors of skiing in real life. All right, next mode. Let's see. Now, it looks like time doesn't matter. But I think you have to make it through so many before it moves on to the last segment of it. I do want everyone to know when we see arcade games that if the arcade game is simple, like Space Invaders, you know, we can breeze by playing for a few minutes and that's it. But if the game has different game modes, I want to see as many as possible before we move to the next one. Are we getting time? I don't think we're getting time for that. All right, if they are counting this, <laughs> someone's in a snowmobile. What a cheater. But we're not losing that much time. This is all about the skill. Using the two-way joystick. Now, I think we're doing pretty good. They, they, they better give us the last game mode. All right, feels like it's close to... <laughs> <laughs> oh, lose lots of time, though. It takes off 10 seconds every time you fall. Not good. Oh, we did it. Okay, we get to see the next game mode. So the last and final one is the jump. And just in case, hold on. I'm going to go back to referring to the manual because they tell us what to do. In the jump competition, use the radar in the upper portion of the screen to maximize the distance of the jump for points. Oh, and you get to play longer if you do well on the jump. All right, here we go, using the radar. Oh, we're going. <laughs> Very cool effect. It reminds me of the winter sports for the Atari 2600 that we haven't seen yet. But the, 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 the jump is very enjoyable. All right, so that's Alpine Ski in the arcade. Awesome game for the time. Definitely above average. If you consider all the other arcade titles, this is the first arcade game. And it doesn't have the gimmick of you standing on skis in the arcade. It's just a, a control panel, two-way joystick and a button. But uh, still excellent game for the time. Three different ways you can play. We're going to go four stars for Alpine Ski. And we're considering with all the other arcade games for the time. Oh, Chiptune's going high. Yeah, it is good. Four stars, though, for Chronologically Gaming. Here we go. Let's see what our next game is after Alpine Ski. We're next going to IBM PC. This is Battle of the Bulge, Bulge Tigers in the Snow. 
Let's take a look at the box for Battle of the Bulge, Tigers in the Snow, the IBM version. This box actually is a little bit thicker than that, believe it or not. And we've seen this one in a couple other flavors for home computers. This one is the PC version in 1982, at least some point in January 1982. And we have the manual. This one is a tactical strategy game by SSI, Strategic Simulations Incorporated. And if we are not going to go through the whole manual because it is epic. It is about the computer simulation of the Battle of the Bulge that took place during World War II in December 1944. So you can choose either to play either Allied or German forces. And it has the top-down hex view where you control all the different uh, soldiers or units and decide what they're going to do. And it, it is full-on tactical strategy game. And let's pop it and play some Battle of the Bulge Tigers in the Snow by SSI. Yes. The PC version by Edward Haar. Way to go, Edward. And for everyone that's watching and wants to know what, what computer were we playing on the time, well, this one's an 8086 running at 4.77 megahertz. So just bear that in mind. 4.77 megahertz is currently what we'd be playing on in 1982. Now, there is a higher one, but uh, that's what we're playing to make this game run specifically. All right, here we go. Let's press any key to continue. Tigers in the Snow, do you have a color monitor? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We shelled out the money for the color monitor. What color palette? We'll stick with one. Do you want to play on a hex grid? Yes. Got to play that way. Do you want a computer to play a demonstration? And yes. We're going to have the computer play, and you can see one of the biggest differences between the Atari version and the Apple II version of this is the speed because we're on a more powerful system. If you bought an, if you spent the money, I think it's three grand right now for, for uh, one of the best IBM PCs, maybe even higher than that, four grand, you would get the best, fastest processing power. So it's calculating all the moves and it's going w way faster than the Apple II or the Atari 800 that we played on. So it's, it's auto playing the game. So it's doing a demonstration of the game. All the units are on the left side. Whenever you play, you determine which you, where the units are going to move and how they're going to attack. It's, at this point, more like the board games or the war game board games that you could play, but now in, in computer form. So it looks like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but this is how you would have played one, a, a very good tactical strategy game for the time. There is better, though. Uh, if you wanted to nitpick the other tactical strategy games, this one isn't top tier. It's, it's, it's okay, but SSI has done much better games. If, though, you wanted to play a specific time in World War II and do the battle, this is it. <laughs> all right, that was Battle of the Bulge, Tigers in the Snow. Of all the games we've seen up to this point, it's actually subpar uh, if you consider all the computer games. We've seen better tactical strategy games, but if this is your thing, then you definitely would give it a higher higher score. All right, so that's two and a half stars for Battle of the Bulge, Tigers in the Snow. And yes, all, all the games we play on Chronological Gaming, we're doing every kind of version too. So if a game came out for four or five computers, we're going to play them all, or at least showcase them all, just like we did here. All right, let's press forward and see our next game. We're next going to the TRS-80 Coco. This is Blockbuster. Released at some point in January 1982, we have nothing but the screenshots for this one, so we're just going to pop it in place on Blockbuster. What's going to happen? Will it crash? We've had pretty good luck on the Coco. All right, so we're going to be doing basic for this one. I want to play block busted. At least it looks like for the command. And I believe this one is going to use the analog controls. Do we need instructions? Yes. How do we play Blockbuster? This game is played with a right joystick and a push button. So we'll use analog joystick and you control the left and right position of a paddle on the screen. Object is to bounce the ball. Oh, it's a block game. It's it's it's, it's Breakout. So you you're, we're just playing Breakout. We don't need controls for that. The button's used to serve the ball. You're allowed five balls per game. You apply English to a ball by moving your paddle when the ball strikes it. Okay, sweet. So we can play English. What's your name? Chrono. What level do we want? Ooh, uh, yikes. We're a pro at this, so I'm going to say 10. Let's see how it works. All right, we're in. Yeah, controls feel very good for the time. Nice. Where's the sound, though? Oh, yeah, you can have this really nuanced way to control the ball at the whenever it hits the paddle, which is kind of cool. But it's it's ball and paddle game, so now it's not really how well the game is programmed 
it's how much would you want to play a ball and paddle game at this point in January 1982? Because this this is it, it, this is great. I mean, there's nothing to complain about it. Th this this feels just like Super Breakout, as I you know am dying trying to narrate at the same time. Well, we got to score 240. Do you want the same game and player? Yes. Let's go. And it does give you that slight control of applying English to the ball, as they say, but it's only whenever it strikes the paddle, and it doesn't matter where on the paddle it is, because you play, play, played some ball and paddle games where you hit it at a certain point on the paddle, and that determines where it's going to go, but not here. It's just you moving the analog joystick right whenever it, it strikes it. <laughs> yes, has Intellivision done a breakout game yet? Or a, a, a ball breaking one? I believe they have. We played a lot of games here. I've seen a lot of stuff, man. All right, that's great. Yeah, so if you want to play a ball and paddle game, sure, that, that, that's really well, very well done for Blockbuster. How well it is on considering and the other games we've seen at this point, it's uh, I'm still gonna say subpar. Not because of how well it's how, how well it's programmed, just the the content. A ball and paddle game is it's it's all right. It's not the best thing you could do at that point. <laughs> yeah, it also, like we did with the strategy games, is this your genre? Because some people at the time in 1982, this is all the games they wanted to play. If the game was like Pong, they still just wanted that. And so if that was what you wanted on TRA City Coco, this would be a five-star game. But for all us on Chronological Gaming, we're playing them all. We'll say two and a half stars for Blockbuster. All right, let's see what our next game is. We're now going still on the TRA City Color Computer, and this is Blockade. Let's take a look at Blockade and see what it's all about. This is another one. We don't have the box front, but we do have a pamphlet of whatever you wanted to play. This one is one of the type-in games. The next program loads is one of our more popular C-load entries. The color computer version is as good, no better. If you have joysticks, use them. If you don't, you can use the keyboard to play. You win by reaching 100 points, being 100 points ahead of your opponent. So this one is the uh, the blockade is the name that it was in the arcade for the kind of snake variant style games. Here we go. Let's pop and play blockade for the TRS-80 color computer at some point in January 1982. And as usual, let's load this sucker up. Will it crash? Blockade. Another one in basic. A lot of help from L. Curtis B. on both of these. Thank you so much. There we go, two-person real-time game of skill and strategy. Object of blockade is simple. Outscore your rival by hitting more targets. Be careful, though. If you hit anything but a target or hit yourself, you lose 10 points. And so forth and so forth. So I'm all by myself. We're going to do one player. And then do we want keyboard or joystick? I'm going to go keyboard this time for play control. And there it is. Up is up, down is down, but left is Q and right is W. Oh, I forgot to enter my name, but... It's Chrono, or Mr. Arcade, as I've heard them say. Oh, and it does where you, if you push back into your own snake, then you die. So that, that's not fun. Yep, if you accidentally push back in your own snake, then you're done. That's, it's, it's just all over. And we've seen that before, like on the TI-99. But here it is. And I'm playing against the computer, which is kind of cool because we don't really see a lot of a computer. The computer just die? Wait, what? The computer just went... The computer is warping around the screen or something. And then the way it works is you are a snake, you pick up different power-ups, and you get longer and longer, and then until you, you win or block the other person in. A la blockade. All right, so just like we said before, it's not really how it was programmed. This one was okay. We've seen better on the home computer. Uh, so I would say this one's still a subpar game. It's not... Uh, let me think of if it's in the bad range. No, I, I wouldn't say... It's still about two and a half stars. It's not something that is particularly very good for the time, but it's also the content. It's, uh, it's, it's a genre that is... It, it's worn out its welcome already. Because we've seen this since the 70s. Yeah, and uh, Nibbler's another name. Yeah, good point. All right, that was Blockade. Let's see what our next game is. It's not a game at all. It's the latest release of the Computer Gaming World magazine. This is volume two, number one, for J uh, January and February 1982, I believe. Yeah, so the January-February release of Computer Gaming World. 
You would have seen this at some point in January. Nice homage to 2001 A Space Odyssey <laughs> with the five and a quarter floppy disk on the front. I love it. And then we go forward with an ad from, uh, I believe this is SSI, right? Yeah. So they have Southern Command, Napoleon's Campaigns, and a few others. Now, just bear in mind, this magazine, Computer Gaming World, is where you would have gone for all the computer enthusiasts. So this covers almost every home computer, uh, and they are more in the strategy or simulation style games, at least for this magazine. So all those nerds that wanted to play some uh, tactical strategy games, this was the magazine for you. We're going to breeze by the table of contents because we're going to go through pretty much everything. And then uh, we don't need to go through the from the editor. This section has some things about uh, different articles that we're going to be bringing out later. And then what's funny is right above my, my side, they have corrections of things they made mistakes on from their previous Computer Gaming World issue. Like, one of them is a weird one. Uh, they left out the Democratic candidates <laughs> for a, a game we checked out called President-Elect. Must be Republicans or something. All right, so we got hobby, in industry, and news. A lot of info here. It looks over, if you look on the far side, according to John Williams, not the musician, but a different John Williams of online systems, Atari lost a preliminary injunction against the distribution of Jawbreaker. But Jawbreaker still being shipped, says Williams. And that would be what we talked about in the latest issue of Softline magazine. There's already lawsuits coming in, and it's really going to start hitting hard on which games are licensed or not licensed. We're going to see that by the mid-1980s. They start going crazy with licensed games. And then next we have the release of Mouse Attack for the Atari home computer and the long-awaited time zones here. And there it is. The multi-disc game will sell for $99.95, $100. The one we just played last episode. And then the few books that are coming out that are like the How to Master Video Games. A pretty good read. I haven't read the second one. I have a volume two there. And then we also have Avalon Hills games coming out, Computer Stocks and Bonds. And what's, what's great about reading these magazines on, on the show, we, we have played majority of these games. Look, there's Galaxy, Shootout at the OK, OK Galaxy, Close Assault, Guns of Fort Defiant. Yeah, we, all, all these games we played. Then we have uh, Board of Bun's newest release is David's Midnight Magic, which I don't believe we've seen that one yet, but we will. It's another pinball game. Then we have some by Sirius Software coming out. Twerps. Not familiar with that one, but we'll see that one. Borg and then Snakebite. And then Sirius Software has a new address. Okay, thanks. I don't know if we need to know that. And then we have other games by SSI. So this is the kind of stuff that they cover on this magazine. Computer gaming. The big ones. The detailed ones. The games for thinkers. I mean, look at this. This is an ad here for Silas Warner's uh, Robot War, where you program a robot to play the game. Another one we've seen on the show. It's uh, one we couldn't dive into too deep because you literally are going to program like a programmer for your computer and then we have some stuff over there for starfighter and then shadowhawk one draw poker i don't think we went through that one because of, of the the gambling and I, I didn't want to work too hard to find out a bunch of uh, poker games and then we have uh, southern command computer quarterback oh computer baseball simulated sports games and the linguist yeah we'll breeze by that one so moving on to the one of the big articles which is the Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig. And this is a tactical strategy game we've seen on the show. If you want to go on the links down below, you can see what we uh, talked about for that one. Pretty fun, pretty fun. As we scroll down, this is a lot. This is about how to play the game and what the game's about uh, in, in lots of depth. They even have the map that comes in the box and how to use that on the magazine, which is pretty helpful. If you wanted it from in 1982. But I mean, look at this long article about just one game in depth, breaking down how they were playing it because this game takes place over a certain time period. Oh, and it also is pointing out, this article is pointing out the historical inaccuracies of this game. And then we move on to the next one, which is the other campaign, Napoleon's campaign, 1813 and 15. A different one by SSI, but another big one for the time. And here we have an ad for, this looks like Atari 800, Eastern Front. Oh, there it is, the Chris Crawford ad right there in the center. It's so tiny, and it's such a good deal. For disc, 30 bucks for disc. This is, in my opinion, the best strategy game you could play for the time. On Atari, it, it, it runs way better than anything else. Too bad, it's just a small ad, and it just blends in with the others. But that is, that is gold, Eastern Front 1941. 
And then right here above my shoulder is the Scott Adams Adventures. They show nine, but I know they have uh, all tw 12. Maybe it's 13 that he has up to this point. And then our next article is about the Sword Thrust series. Now, the two biggest role-playing games right now are Wizardry and Ultima. Sword Thrust is another, another really good one. It, it's the kind of game that you have to save your character to a disc. And Sword Thrust was one of the first games to do that before the others came out. So it's an older series, but it, it progresses and goes along for, for a while, like the Dungeon Quest series. It's not just one game. It's already uh, several series. I believe they're on three or four of Sword Quest. Or sorry, th Sword sword Thrust. And then scroll through this one. Our next ad is for Galaxy. And this was the, uh, the trilogy of games. I think it's Galaxy Empires. Galaxy Trader or Galactic Trader, and uh, there's a third one that uh, doesn't come to mind. But this is, an, uh, this is another like space trading merchant game. As we breeze by this one, then we have an ad for, there we go, Sword Thrust, Mission Escape, which I don't know if we've seen that one. Probably, we'll probably see that one later. And then Wall Street, the, the okay one, uh, if you want to play a stocks and bonds style strategy game. And then this one's cool, Castle Wolfenstein. The Way Out, one of the best titles of 1981, still up there in 1982. We'll be seeing the sequel for this one at some point uh, coming, coming forward, but Castle Wolfenstein is incredible. This is kind of like, like tips and tricks to play the game. And then they have Tanktix, which is another one we checked out. This one I didn't score as high because it's a hybrid board game, video game. So uh, it, it, a lot of these war games and tactical games started as board games. And this one still is using the board, and then the computer does the calculations for you. But you still have to have all the little pieces on it. So review and analysis for Tanktix. Yeah, they even say, is this a board game? Are you playing a board game or a computer game? It's more board game. And then we have a really cool comic for Castle Wolfenstein. In a corridor of the castle, oh, we have a, someone being thrown out over on the left side panel. Another escape attempt from Castle Wolfenstein is foiled, or someone died. And in a cold corridor of the castle, another allied soldier is interrogated. Schweighund! You refuse to cooperate. Your insolence is useless. But hours later, as dawn breaks on Castle Wolfenstein, a solitary figure makes his way out of the, pro the progress, out of the fortress, and toward freedom. So it's like people are playing the Castle Wolfenstein, and some are dying, and then one person is making it out. Still going for thirty bucks on the Apple II. You need forty-eight k of memory for that one. Yikes! And then over here in Programmers Corner, I think they have some typing games for us. Yeah, this is some uh, tips and tricks for Tanktix. Long articles they have in Computer Gaming World. And this is TG products for paddles and joysticks, if you don't want the official ones. We use the official ones here on Chronologically Gaming. And then we have Atari Arcade. What's happening in the arcade? They talked about Eastern Front, but that's for the Atari home computer. Then we have Jawbreaker, Galactic Chase, Protector, and then Pac-Man. Which they're 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 making it where they know Jawbreaker is ripping off Pac-Man, but they're referring to it as it's just whether you call it Jawbreaker or Pac-Man, it's it's pretty much the same thing. And then we breeze through the next section. It's another really niche game. This is the strategy baseball game where you don't really play baseball. It's not action. It's not arcade. It is all stats. So if you want to get the nitty gritty with that, that's the that's the game to, to play. I, think, I believe that's SSI too, right? No, I'm sorry, that's Avalon Hill for uh, computer baseball. Then they have a crossword puzzle just for fun. And another game we've pl played on the channel, Operation Apocalypse. It's okay. The big best ones we've already seen on the show, and I don't think they've hit them on here, except I'd say Castle Wolfenstein. And then they're talking about the book, book review for How to Master Video Games. Then another game is coming out soon, Genetic Drift. And... We can breeze by Webster's Guide. That's funny. And over here on the left side is Red Alert. I don't think we've seen Red Alert yet, but we will. And then Wall Street, which would be the uh, the bad of the two, really the, the, the worst of the two best stock simulation games you could play in 1982. So we'll sque squeeze down some more. And then Cartels and Cutthroats, another pretty good one for the time. And then this is our last. Is this the end of it? Let's see. Oh, and then we have a few of the game reviews. Now, the, the, they're doing the classic 1982 game reviews. They just talk about the game. There is no rating system or numbers in, like we saw from Softline. Uh, so we have Escape from Arcturus, which is another one we've checked out on the show. Pretty generic space shooter. And then the online systems games 
that are out. And I think they have so, some tips and tricks for that because the review is to give you a, some help, but not a lot. It's more of just, is it worth buying the game, basically? And then is this Zork next? Yes, Zork. We're going to see the release of Zork 2 at some point this year. Uh, no, we've already seen it on TRS-80. We've seen Zork 2. Uh, Zork 3 will be released this year. And then there's Blitzkrieg. You can see, I don't even think that's a screenshot. It must be recreated for Blitzkrieg, an action-style shooter game. And then we have Ultima. Yeah, there we go. They're calling it similar to a Calabeth, but this review is, they rave about Ultima. Ultima is like the way to go. And considering we saw someone in Softline Magazine saying Wizardry was the better of the two, but you're always going to have the fans. Then we have the Battle of Shiloh, then Shattered Alliance. This review is a pretty cool because Shattered Alliance is the fantasy version of SSI strategy games. Instead of taking place in real world history, it's on a far off distant planet, similar to like Lord of the Rings, but a whole new lore. A different a different uh, twist on what SSI usually does, but it's pretty cool because it's the precursor to what Dungeons and Dragons, when they get the license for the uh, advanced D&D &D games for the computer. And then here's an ad for uh, synergistic software, Escape from Arcturus, Odyssey the Complete Adventure. Not a typo, it's real. And then the Planetary Guide. And then Protector. And last, finishing up with an ad by Avalon Hill. With a few of your games. So there you go. What's happening in the world of computer gaming in January and February 1982? All right, let's press forward and see our next game. We're next going to another one we've seen before, but not on the IBM PC. This is Crossfire. Let's take a look at the box for Crossfire. Now, this one is pretty interesting with the release because we have one release that came out in 1982, but then if I show you the other box, this is the front and back of the 1982 release. And then look at this box. This box is on the IBM PC, well, around the time when the PC Junior came out. You can see the copyright's 1983. So we're gonna see this game again, released for the IBM, uh, and, uh, the IBM PC and PC Junior as the second release. So the one I'll be showing today is the first one that's really close to the one we saw on the Atari 800 and the Apple II. And there it is, the five and a quarter floppy disk by Sierra Online. And that was an example of what you'd see for the IBM PC Junior. And same thing for the manual. Look at the manual. It's not the, main, the, the manual for this release. This release is for the IBM PC Junior. You can see in the top right corner. All right, let's pop in to play some Crossfire. Released sometime in January 1982 by Sierra Online. Here we go. This is by Jay Sullivan and Frank Randack. Way to go, Jay and Frank. And you can see down at the bottom, it still says Online Systems, not Sierra Online. All right, so we can play with Joystick. And we're good. It starts with an attract mode. And if you remember this before, it's a Targ variant. We've seen this on... A few other home computers already. And this release really looks similar to the Atari version. But competition is fierce now in 1982. We're going to be playing so many games. I do enjoy the way this game plays, where you can fire four different directions. So I have, um, uh, I'm able to move four different directions and fire four different directions. And then they have those dots in the center. You pick up your bullets and you keep going. All right, looking pretty good. But you can see how the game plays. It is a excellent Targ variant. <laughs> there was a color, com uh, if you had the correct computer in 1982, you could get some more color. But I'm going to hold off and wait until we see the version that came out for the PC Junior next year. Or, I mean, next year, like 1983. But it, it's really technically not the PC Junior version, because PC Junior is released in 1984, I believe. But we do have a box that says it's 83. Alright, so that was Crossfire. Crossfire is still good, still fun. 
while it's in black and white, it still has the enjoyment that we're looking for. Of all the games we've seen up to this point, Crossfire is still, um, I'd say, about three stars. About pretty pretty average for all the games we've seen up to this point. So a good average game for 1982. Let's see what our next game is. We're next going to play Dragon's Lair. No way! Oh, it's not that Dragon's Lair. We don't get to see that until 1983. So sorry to pull your chain. This is Dragon's Lair for the Commodore VIC-20. I believe released in Europe as part of a compilation called Innovative Cassette 3. It had seven different programs and Dragon's Lair was part of it. So believe it or not, there's a Dragon's Lair before the famous Dragon's Lair. All right, let's, let's pop in and play some Dragon's Lair for the Commodore VIC-20 released at some point in January 1982 by Melbourne House. Yeah, when I first came across it, I was like, oh my gosh, Dragon's Lair! But it's a text adventure game. So here you go, this is Dragon's Lair for the Commodore VIC-20 in 1982. You've entered the evil-smelling tow- wait, evil-smelling? How does something smell evil? Which contains a small animal rummaging in the corner. It, what, it, is evil-smelling mean- are we in the, the toilet or something? Something smells evil. What do we do now? Now we... go west. I don't understand. Okay, go east. Go north. Go south. Oh, the monster won't let you. Oh, okay, the monster won't let us. What's my inventory? We have 15 strength, zero silver coins. You have one sword, no staff units. We got one sword. Kill animal. I don't understand. Uh, kill monster. I don't understand. Oh man, this is one of those text parsers that doesn't understand anything. All right, let's think. If it's an old English game, what about Slay Monster? It works. The beast is dead. What in the world? You don't understand attack. You don't understand kill, but you understand slay. Weird, Dragon's Lair. Weird. All right, so can we get beast? I don't understand. Okay, go west. Oh my gosh, go north. Go south. What? The beast is gone. Move. Is the beast in the way or something? Move monster. I don't understand. Look beast. Look monster. No. Do you understand anything? This is like the worst text adventure game so far. Can we even say W? I didn't think so. East, south. North. Man, you know what this does? This makes me miss Scott Adams Adventure Games. <laughs> oh man, so Dragon's Lair. Uh, while I had your attention with Dragon's Lair, we definitely left on a low, note, a low point. Now, we don't have a manual, and it's obviously part of a compilation, but this is terrible. Uh, it definitely broken, I'm gonna say. Uh, this is a one-star game, maybe even half-star. Uh, yeah, we'll go half-star. It's, it's pretty bad. We played a lot of text adventure games, too. Anything that makes you want to play a Scott Adams adventure game means it's got to be really bad. All right, so that was Dragon's Lair. Not the one you think for the Commodore VIC-20. Let's see our next game. Oh, yes. We're going to the arcade. I'm so excited. So this is Explorer in the arcade. Let's take a look at the artwork for Explorer. All right, so we have two different Explorer video games. This is the first, the one we're going to be really showcasing. This is by Data East, so it's another Deco cassette system. Explore. Your wonderful three-dimensional galaxy adventure begins. Handle your special Explorer craft and penetrate the space fortress to destroy the enemy within. Okay. And the screenshots look really bizarre down below. They have two different ones. And there's the example of the different arcade cabinet because there's another game called Explore. That's a total scramble ripoff. I mean, literally, like, like, they could have ripped the whole PCB off. So this is a totally different scramble. Ready? Data East scramble, totally different scramble. I mean, uh, uh, Data East Explorer, totally different Explorer. And then here's our control panel. We have the Data East Deco Cassette control panel, and then the marquee for the other Explorer. We, they're, like, blended together. And so this is the Explorer that's a total ripoff in Italy by Saddam. So if you want to see what Explore in Italy looked like, it looked like this. It's a full-on bootleg of Scramble. So with all the fans out there that played Explore first in Italy, this is what you would have seen. Your task is to drive Explore to the last base, because that's what you are. 
let's put a coin in or a lira if we're in Italy and then put start playing explore in Italy in the arcades oh my gosh is there no sound at all well probably if we have a bootleg I guess we're not gonna no one spent a lot of time to emulate explore in Italy but it looks exactly like scramble there's I can't really even tell the difference between the two yeah it's it's exactly the same even the top showing you where you are fuel down at the bottom I can't even tell if there's a palette swap it looks almost identical well maybe without the sound so there you go there's explore from Italy but now let's check out explore in Japan we're gonna go to Japan and play the data east version of explore the real explorer in the arcades released at some point in January 1982 let's go Oh, that's right. It's the Deco Cassette system. This means we have to load this in blazing fast speeds. We can't wait for these Deco Cassettes to play. It's going to take too long. We're speeding this sucker up. So now that we're in Japan in the arcades, we're going to see a lot of these Deco Cassette systems because it, it's really, really helpful for operators when they can just switch out a cassette for a whole arcade system instead of doing a, a conversion kit or buying a whole new arcade cabinet very cool and some of these deco cassette games have been amazing like their pro golf game is awesome all right we're in playing some explorer in japan let's put a coin in and see what it's like i already like the sound effects already and the colorful starfield here we go push and start we're in whoa it is 3d Whoa, cool! And it's doing... No way, it's doing like a faux sprite scaling. Okay, who's with me and played the Sega Master System? Doesn't this look like you're playing Space Harrier on the Sega Master System right now? Because you can see the sprites in the back coming at us. They have an outline around them. Like they're really pushing the, the system as hard as it can. What's weird is I feel like this should be controlled with a flight stick or something else, but this is controlled with the same joystick as the what's built into the, the Daddy's Deco Cassette system. Whoa, cool, we get a cutscene? Nice. That's true, you, you could just call it the tunnel shooter like Tempest, right? But now we switch to a fixed shooter. I'm just moving left and right, that's all I got. And only one button for control. It's just fire everything, kill them all. Whoa, bizarre enemies, though. <laughs> Feels like I'm playing a Jackson Pollock video game. Everything is meant to be interpreted how you want. What do you see when you stare at this enemy? Still going. Is there another scene? We go to 3D now. Oh, yeah, cool. So it doesn't it doesn't make you go around the outside like Tempest. I can move to the center if I want to, but it's just not as accurate because the controls make it so that you you can't hover there for a long time because we're not playing on a flight stick joystick. We're playing on a digital joystick, so it, it it's because of the limitations of the Data East system, but still pretty cool. If you don't make it, the enemies go around the outside, but it looks like they go away eventually. Yeah, they just leave the side. Cool perspective. We've seen it before. It's amazing that they're, they're, they're doing this on a cassette system. And then we're back. So it looks like we go back and forth between 2D and 3D for Explorer. Sweet. All right, so that was the real Explorer we wanted to showcase in Japan. Of all the games we played up to this point, that's pretty good. Uh, for 1982, it's, it's, I would still say, an above-average game fun for the time. We'll say three and a half stars for Explorer. The fixed shooter part is, eh. 
it's what we've seen plenty of times, but uh, really cool that you could switch this out with a cassette cassette system and just go right to this after all the other games you can play, too. All right, so I'll let, after Explorer and we're going to the arcades, let's see where we're going now. It's time to go back home for the Atari home computer, and this is Final Exam. Is this educational? What is Final Exam? We have only a screenshot, no box for this one. Well, let's pop it and play some Final Exam and see what it's all about at some point in January 1982. Published by Silicon Valley Systems. Okay, I'll play along. Looks like this is by Larry Blink and James Davis. Way to go, Larry and James. I'm really not sure if this is educational or not, but I am very quick to turn and push the power button if it happens. <laughs> Created by Blink and Davis. Blink and Davies. Davis? Davis. Blink and Davis. You are preparing for your final exam by trying to acquire study units. Study units are acquired uh, by accumulating time. 100 study units to pass. Two study units equal five time units plus 10 energy units. Simple, no? No! <laughs> because you're being assaulted by numerous distractions, you have options on dealing with these disturbances. But there are consequences, good and bad. Okay, this is kind of fun. Press return to start. Here we go. Wouldn't you know it, the guys next door are having a beer bust and stereo wars. What will you do? What, is this a morality style game? Are you supposed to pick the right thing? So we have, we can complain and say, be quiet. We can say, forget the books, let's party. Ignore the rabble and carry on. Let's do, forget the books, let's party. Great. You're so loaded, it will take a crane operator to get you home. <laughs> so this isn't necessarily a text adventure game. Oh, it shows us our status. Do you want to convert study units into energy units? Do you want to convert? We'll just say no. Your roommate has scored on some excellent recreational drugs. <laughs> and they have a siren go off. Indulge or abstain. It's a video game. We're indulging. It's acid. You realize the entire exam has no basis in reality, so why study? <laughs> this is the kind of game where you just make choices and decisions. So it looks like we now have 20 time units, negative five energy units. Your girlfriend suddenly drops in on you and onto your waterbed, ready for action. Go forward or not tonight, I have to study. Well, let's try to do, no, not tonight, I have to study. She says she's going to the party next door. Oh dear. Well, she's probably a terrible girlfriend. If she bails in you to go to a party next door. And so now we have 105 time units, negative 30 energy units. You are so hungry. Let's eat. While being pumped, the doctor gives you a note. The professor gives you more time to study. Oh, that's nice. So this is an interesting style game. It's not where you're playing necessarily a text adventure game. You're just making decisions. The airport changed the local flight pattern to right over your room. <laughs> and I'm guessing all this is random. So every time you play, you get a different, uh, different decisions. So we fight back. Let's move, buy earmuffs, call the FAA. Let's do that, call the FAA. The FAA has sent you IRS after you. <laughs> oh, this is just fun. These kind of games are perfect for the time. If you want something that's in entertainment, but it's not uh, doing anything like super crazy with your processing power. Sheila, your ex-girlfriend has come back in your life and aims to disrupt your thought processes permanently. Shoot it out? What does that mean? You're gonna kill your ex-girlfriend? Beg for your life or tell her murder is a sin. <laughs> Let's shoot it out. You missed. She didn't. Ouch. We really shot our ex. We shot at our ex girlfriend. <laughs> we never know what kind of game we're going to get into. I've never heard of this game before. The phone is ringing off the hook. Wait, if she shot us, why don't we go to the hospital? We're not dead either. Answer it, stupid. Let it ring. Throw the phone out the window. Throw that phone out the window. They have sound effects to go with it. Now you've done it. The phone company is going to throw you out the window. <laughs> so they're giving you consequences for what you decide, but you have options to pick one of those. <laughs> and it looks like we suffered a stroke. <laughs> oh my gosh. And that would be game over. Press start. Okay, so yeah, we're we are on the Apple II. I mean, sorry. Uh, oh man, uh, we're on the Atari. Forget which we're, we're playing on. We're we're on the Atari playing. Press return to start. 
Wouldn't you know it? And so it starts over. It looks like it's the same decisions, though, so maybe I was wrong. It's not random. This time, let's buckle down and study. Let's ignore the rabble and carry on. Fine. You are still distracted. <laughs> Can you not make uh, 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 cogent decisions? Does everything turn out terrible with a flashing screen? <laughs> Do you wish to convert any? Yes. Let's say yes. So now we have some study units, and our time units went down. So let's do again. Let's convert. We're preparing for an exam. So this is a simulation, life, our, our very first life simulation game. All right, let's say no. What's our next decision? Roommate scored some excellent recreational drugs. This time we will say no to drugs. Two, your roommate is annoying you. Man. Wait, he was on drugs recreational drugs wouldn't he not be annoying us all right what happens now negative energy units we have some time units your girlfriend suddenly okay so it looks like it's the same idea so nothing super expansive like for it, it's one of those just fun to play for a minute or two because it's the same game every time go for it you were sensational now your ego makes you really study like in real life not really do you want to convert me? We'll say yes. We're going to study a lot. That was an experience. We played plenty of text adventure games, and we played games that give you choices, like uh, simulating a lemonade stand or a business. We've even seen some games where you're uh, si simulating how to uh, 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 go through an, uh, an adventure game like a cave, like in the Black Sage, but nothing like this. Now, you, you obviously saw that every time you played, it's the same thing. So most likely this was like a type in game for fun. But still for the time, uh, just to have a game that allows this to happen and you pick choices, it's kind of cool because it's showing like different things from morality. While it's not necessarily accurate, it's still uh, pretty cool for the time. Yeah, very low replay value. I'd say it's, uh, I'm going to say subpar. Two and a half stars for final exam. It's quaint and fun for a minute or two. All right, let's see what our next game is after final exam. We're next going back to the IBM PC. This is Galaxy. Another one that we checked out last year for other home computers. There is the box for Galaxy by the Avalon Hill Company. We're completing the whole set to play all of the strategy games in 1982. What else do we have for Galaxy? We have the advertising flyer with everything. Controller, Guns of Fort Defiance, Niper Riverline, Voyager. Oh, I don't think we've seen Voyager yet, but we will. We'll, we'll be collecting the whole set. Now, I'm actually going to breeze by the manual because this game is a poorly designed, for the time, tactical strategy game where you're doing what's considered like space exploration and acquiring uh, uh, minerals and selling those minerals in different places. But let's pop in and play some Galaxy for IBM PCs at some point in January 1982. Are you ready? Probably the best sounds from the IBM so far, believe it or not. <laughs> Do we want a new game? Yes. How many players do we want? And look how many players you can have in Galaxy. 20 players. Now, this is all played on one computer, so which means you hot seat 20 different people. Not going to happen. We'll just say two for now. How many worlds do you want to play with? We'll say five, because we're doing 40. And then how many turns? So this is an epic game. Really fun to play if you had a lot of nerds that wanted to play a strategy game that involves you going around the, an entire galaxy finding different um, uh, planets, searching out new life, kind of like a Star Trek thing, but done on a scale where it's more like a board game. So you you, you take turns. All right, so how many turns do we want to do? We're not going to play this long. Three turns. Should neutral worlds build defensive ships? Nope. And then the names for everybody. Let's do Crow. No, looks like yeah, we can only have four letters. And last person in the chat was M. Tisky. So we'll do Tisk. And so the way the game begins is it gives you an overview of the entire galaxy. You can see different letters represent different planets. 
Everything that's blue is represented by the players. Everything that's neutral is white. You want to go travel to those planets, find out what it is, collect what you can, get money, and then be more successful controlling the galaxy than the other people that play. But you can tell by the presentation, this is pretty much it, what you see here. And so we'll say no, we don't want a new setup. And then what it does is it has the text only interface. So you do everything from this and input the commands you want to do. So they're asking Tisk first or Tisky, what do you want to do first? And you give the commands of where you want your ships to go and how you send a different uh, like fleets around the galaxy. And so that's a brief, very brief example of Galaxy. For the time, it is subpar for all the games we've seen. And at this point, 1982, I'm going to say it's a bad game because we've seen lots of better ones, especially when you consider Star Trek, the strategy game Star Trek. It's, it's great. So two stars for Galaxy. And with that, let's see what our next game is. We're still on the IBM PC, and this is Golf in 1982. This one we don't have a box for, and you'll see why. Golf is another curious one. Released at some point in January 1982, here's Golf by Steve Essel. Way to go, Steve. International PC Golf. Press any key to continue. Now, Golf is a text-only golf game. That's right. What kind of game do you want to play? It's, it's all random with lots of different variations to play, but we'll just say, we'll pick seed 50. Are you a new member of the club? Let's say yes. You're about to play a round of golf at the new and exciting Essex Country Club. Here's your clubs. You have four is numbers one through four are your woods. Numbers two through nine are your irons. And then you have a putter and a wedge. Do you want enter for instructions? Yeah. A putter can use only on the green. You put by inputting a number one to ten. So this is a text-only golf game. I'm just, just phrase yourself. It's like we're playing on a mainframe computer in the 60s because this is what it is on uh, your IBM PC. So it asks you the question, is like a text adventure game. Which type of club do you want to use? For now, you'll ask only wedge, iron, or wood. So if we do, what, one? Oh, wedge. We have to type the whole thing in. You can't use a wedge at this distance. Okay, fine, we'll do wood. What number wood? Uh, we want one wood. You hit, and so we, we just hit. 229 yards, you are 145 yards away. And so this is how the game is played out. It's all text as a golf game. And we've already seen plenty of graphical gar golf games. And that's all I'm going to showcase for golf for the IBM PC. Uh, for the time, it's if you were into that as a throwback to what you could play on a mainframe computer, then it would be kind of cool and niche. But for our purposes, I'm going to say two stars. It does do what it's supposed to do, and it is kind of cool if you wanted to play that way. But no, we've seen a lot better golf games, definitely. So two stars, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you, Chiptune. Why? Well, it's because this is what it was like in 60s and 70s. And so we're still going to get some of these games coming in. A great example is when we played uh, Wumpus. We had the, the one for the TI-99, which was graphical Wumpus, but then the original was all text. And we might still see that one again, the all text version. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we come to the end of our evening. I'm going to push pause on the game playing. And that's where we're going to be stopping playing everything. We're still in January 1982. And we're going to keep going playing every single video game. That's it for today. And like I always say, why did you make a golf game text only? Hey, everybody. Thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central. So join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.